Hello, everyone. Welcome to Pensive Politics, Mr. Watson. I am your host, Christian Watson. It is good to be with you guys here today. I have someone who was a guest on my show when he was running with a lady called Joe Jorgensen for the presidency of the United States back in the summer, Mr. Spike Cohen. You may know him as the vice presidential, former vice presidential, presidential nominee of the Libertarian Party. And, uh, you know, he was perhaps one of the most fascinating conversations I had in 20. 20. I, I swear, I have never seen someone, especially a libertarian, explain, and that's, that's not a, it's not a slight, explain um, certain issues in such a, uh, a concise and, and approachable way. And so I really appreciate what he's done. I really appreciate what him and Joe were trying to do. And I really appreciate anyone who kind of is divergent from the current political stasis that ensnares our country. So Mr. Cohen, how are you doing? Or Spike, how are you doing? So, I'm, excuse me. I'm doing great, Christian. Thanks so much for having me on, man. I appreciate it. No, it's, it's always a pleasure. It's always a pleasure. So tell me, what's been happening with you and with the Libertarian Party since the election? Because, uh, you know, I, there is a sense amongst a lot of people that the Libertarian Party right now is not, what is the word for it? It's not really a feasible option going forward. Now, I think, I think that sense is can be rectified by a single thing more people going ahead and voting libertarian instead of being bullied into duopoly but 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 beyond that very common sense thing people are still ensnared by this sort of concept of libertarianism not being valuable viable Mm -hmm. so our libertarian party not being viable independent of the republican party so what do you think about that what's your opinion about that and how have things been since the election ended so there, there's a few things there. And, th- and again, thank you for having me on. Um, going to the viability argument, when, like you said, when, when people will ask me, you know, what do you think your odds are uh, of winning this election? And I say that much better if you vote for us, that helps. Uh, having people vote for us helps. But that ultimately, there's, there's a little bit of a cop out there, isn't it? You know, it would be like if I had a, a product, and it wasn't doing well. And I said, well, the problem is people aren't buying it. Well, yeah, but that, that's not really, that may not be the core of the problem. The core of the problem isn't, isn't blaming the, uh, the, the consumer as much as maybe looking at the product. Now, when it comes to politics, the reality is the Libertarian Party is at a very distinct disadvantage. Uh, we are uh, restricted and, and all non-Republicrat candidates are restricted from even getting on the ballot. We have to spend months and millions of dollars and countless man hours uh, in time to, to, to you know, to, fight to get on the ballot through uh, petition signing and, and other regulations that are put up in, from state to state and at the federal level as well, just to be able to even get on the ballot, even though re- Republicans and Democrats pretty much automatically qualify. If you're a Republican or a Democrat, you pretty much pay a small filing fee and you're on the ballot. Whereas if you're running in any other party or as an independent, you have quite an uphill road to, to, to carry just to even be able to get on the ballot. That's before we get into things like the hundreds of millions of dollars that are funneled into uh, into the coffers, the campaign coffers of Republican and Democrat candidates through uh, through the taxpayer funded system that they've created. That's before we get into the crony corporate billions that they get by their their you know cr- crony sponsors. You know, there, there's all sorts of things we can get into when it comes to that. But at the end of the day, the biggest problem that we have is, as libertarians is that most people have no idea who we are. You know, there's the old saying, well, you know, people think that that libertarians are just Republicans who smoke weed or they're just Democrats who like guns. Most people actually have no clue what a libertarian is. And, And, you know, this last year, I went to 35 different states over, I think, something like 75 campaign events, spoke to tens of thousands of people, And quite a few of the people that showed up, they showed up because they saw a bus that had some lady's face on it that they'd never seen before. And it said, you know, running for president on it. And so they'd come to the event just to see what was going on. We we did most of our events outside at like parks and things like that, mostly because of COVID restrictions, but also because that's the easiest way to be able to have many people in a a venue, uh, especially during lockdowns. And uh, they come out and listen to the message and say, wow, that's the best thing I've ever heard. How come I've never heard of you before? And, you know, that's the biggest problem that we face. Now, you're asking how I'm doing. I'm doing fantastic. I, I, I finished the, uh, we did the campaign. And uh, coming out of that, I've been busier than I've ever been in my entire life. Um, it, it's interesting that I've gotten more media attention, national media attention in the last month 
than the entire campaign did during the entire election season. If you if you count up the number of mentions, if you and I'm the vice presidential candidate, I'm not the presidential candidate. If you look at the number of mentions I've gotten on national media, if you look at the number of times I've I've appeared on national media, and it, you know if you combine all that together, that's more than Joe and I got during the entire election last year. Now I think that some of that or most of that is because major media didn't want to acknowledge that we existed last year. They wanted to present their narrative that it was either Donald Trump or Joe Biden, and that's it. Every other choice is, you know, useless. There's no reason to even talk about them. You have to choose between, you know, red flavored tyranny and blue favored tyranny. And it just is what it is. You have to pick which one's the lesser evil. And, uh, you know, you have to just go along with the con game. And so what I'm doing moving forward, I was telling you before we got started, pretty much every starting next weekend, and pretty much every weekend after that, through to November, I'm going to be in another part of the in a different part of the country, spreading the message of liberty, getting libertarians organized and activated to be able to help down ballot candidates to be able to win local races, which libertarians are able to do in every election cycle, uh, help to teach candidates how to spread the message of liberty in that, you know, you were mentioning the clear and succinct way of, of, of promoting libertarian ideas, um, showing how to do that. And uh, really just creating, uh, demystifying the idea of libertarians being able to win elections, because libertarians do win elections at the local level quite a bit, and, uh, and replicate that, and then figure out how to scale that up so that wins at the local level can turn into more wins at the statewide level. And those wins can turn into wins at the federal level and eventually be able to win all the way to the White House. Brilliant. That's brilliant stuff. And I, yeah, I saw in Wyoming. Wyoming is where we got someone elected to the, to the state legislature, correct? And so that's, mm-hmm. that's very exciting stuff. I think that the entire idea from what, I, from what I hear in libertarian circles is to sort of build a bench of people that are going to be at the state and local level. And then so that when they are prepared to, they can go ahead and run for higher office. Do you see that right. as a viable mechanism going forward? Because that may, I think that works very well for Republican or Democratic candidates. But if a person has L next to their name, is, a, is, is their time in the state house even, or the state legislature going to be able to get them enough statewide notoriety or fame or recognition um, to even amount to a, 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 a challenge at a higher level? I think that's exactly what needs to be done. I don't think it's not only, not only do I think it's viable, I think it's really our only true viable option. Christian, for the past 50 years that the Libertarian Party has been elected, it has been in, has been in, in existence, We've kind of fallen into this four-year cycle of, of failure. We start off the election season. We actually start off by losing the previous election. Then coming off of that, we say, well, you know, it happened, you know, it, it happened because the system's rigged against us, but we're going to win. And next time we're going to win. And when we win, we're going to end the Fed, and we're going to end the wars, and we're going to end the war on drugs, and we're going to end taxation, and we're going to end, uh, you know, rampant overspending, and we're going to end the entitlement state, we're going to end this and that and that and blah, 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 and, and all the stuff we like to talk about, all the things that we ultimately want to do as libertarians. That is the goal. And then we spend four years pretty much much talking to each other about who is the best person to do this who is our strong man ironically who is our strong man or strong woman going to be now we are you know naturally resistant to that type of thinking right we're, we're naturally resistant to the idea that all of our hopes rest in one or a handful of people's uh hands in fact we believe that it's just the opposite we need to decentralize power and put the hand power back in the hands of the people but yet when it comes to politics we fall into the Strongman fallacy, fallacy, or strong person fa- fallacy. Who is that person going to be that's going to spread the message of liberty far and wide so that by four years from now, we're going to win the White House on the strength of this one person or on the strength of this one person who we will all fall behind and help promote all the way to the White House where we will then dismantle the structure. We do... We do some ground game. I don't want to say we don't do any ground game. There are some activists across the country that are doing incredible work. But the bulk of our time and resources and attention of the average libertarian is spent on who's going to be our champion for 2020, who's going to be our champion for 2024. Come in the day after, in fact, even before this election happened, I already had people coming up to me. Spike, are you running in 2024? You are the only person to be able to spread liberty far and wide. We need to back you. Are you running in 2024? And I'm like, folks, this isn't it, guys. Like, this isn't how how this works. You don't build something on the strength of one person when you are this small of a group. 
right? And so here is the here are the problems that we are facing. And I saw it time and time again out on the campaign trail. Number one is the fact that the vast majority of people either haven't heard of our ideas, or if they have, or if they've heard of our party, they go, well, they can't win. So that's our first problem is the idea, the self-fulfilling prophecy that we can't win. Then the next problem that we have is the, is the well, your ideas sound good, but are they really going to work? I mean, they sound okay in theory, but you know, what about the roads? What about the schools? What about, you know, our civil society? How is that going to work on, with libertarians in office? Is that, it sounds kind of scary and completely different from anything anyone else is saying. Uh, and then another major problem is not having the actual infrastructure to be able to get boots on the ground and to be able to actually win. Doing all of the things that need to happen to get libertarians elected locally, at the regional level, at the state level, and so forth, are exactly the ways to battle all of those problems. It demystifies the ideas of libertarians getting elected. Well, libertarians can't win. Yeah, we can. We just won, you know, 500 races last last year or last election. You know, being able to say, yeah, we do win. Here, here are all the people that have won. Uh, it gets rid of the idea of, well, it, it, it answers the question of, yeah, well, what would libertarian governance looks like? Well, it looks like what Marshall Burt is doing in Wyoming. It looks like what Kara Schultz is doing in Minnesota. It looks like what Kalish Morrow is doing in California. It looks like um, what um, it looks like what Trisha Butler is doing in Tennessee. And you can give real world examples. So now it's no longer an abstract idea. It's no longer this scary thing that's going to make everything terrible. It's now an actual real world practical common sense thing that's happening and it gets rid of the issue of not having the infrastructure when you have candidates and, and not just the infrastructure but the actual names you can get behind trisha butler doing well in tennessee and city council can eventually run for mayor she can eventually run for governor or for state rep or something like that Kalish morrow can eventually work her way up kara schultz can work her way up marshall burt can work his way up you build a bench you get rid of the and, and, and you build the infrastructure of the candidates, the campaign uh, managers, the campaign teams, the volunteers, the activists, you build a team around winnable goals. And that's the other thing. When you don't give a group of people something to fight for, they're going to fight each other. That is the story in a nutshell of what happens in the libertarian spheres. We are not giving libertarians things to fight for, winnable goals, something like let's grow our state party membership by 10% or 20% this year, or let's increase the number of uh, local and regional affiliates by 50%, or let's get you know four city council people elected in our state. Give them real, reasonable, realistic and attainable goals that they can work together on, give them something to do, give them something positive, build camaraderie, build the idea that we can win and are winning. And then from there, that with the getting rid of the the narrative of they can't win and getting rid of the you know the, the the fears of well what happens when libertarians get elected and building up infrastructure is how we eventually win the white house could it happen in four years maybe but i'll tell you what could happen in four years we could easily win a congressional easily we could very realistically win a congressional race in 2024 or multiple congressional races. We could potentially win a statewide like gubernatorial race or a Senate race. These things can happen, but we have to start working our way towards doing that. It's not necessarily starting from the bottom. It's starting from the foundation of how you get things done. It's how you build a successful organization. So not only is it viable, it's the only viable way. This is, this is awesome. Very good stuff. I mean, I, again, as I mentioned, you have a knack for explaining this stuff very concisely, especially when you're in the infrastructure yourself. So I, I really appreciate that. But as you were talking, there was a one thing going through my head. Um, mm -hmm. You said demystify. And that's a very interesting word. Because there are a lot of people who say libertarians need to stop being so abstract, or stop being so, um, you know, deep with their philosophy when they're on the campaign trail. Yes. Um, now, as someone himself who, who loves philosophy, someone who, who adores philosophy, I mean, if anyone takes a look at my stuff, they can see that philosophy is written all over it, you know, but I do, I do try to explain things concisely, of course, but I just, I, 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 it seems to me as if that particular line of advice is a egregious retreat away from, I think, what makes libertarianism distinct from the two parties right now, 
or right. the, uh, distinct from the two prevailing ideologies that are incumbent in the two parties right now. Because really, in my opinion, Spike, you can tell me if I'm wrong or not, libertarianism is nothing more than the confirmation of many of the ideas that were endemic to the American experiment. And the, the in many ways, yeah. And, 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 and then the, which were an outgrowth of, at least in my opinion, now this is going to be a very, um, someone would say a very narrow interpretation of libertarianism, but in my opinion, and in the opinion of a lot of people, an outgrowth of the concept of natural law and natural rights, and then all that kind of stuff. So for me, there is a, there seems to be an enduring basis for the libertarian ethos um, in reality, especially in political reality. Whereas with the other parties, some of them, they don't, um, some of them don't even have, I mean, let's just be honest, I don't think the Democratic Party really has a, 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 a stable nucleus, as Solzhenitsyn would say, by which they understand their beliefs and their position. No. I, I, right. I think that they're right now, they're involved in just a, a, a sort of miasma of, of chaos and an identity crisis, to, to, be, to be frank. I think, uh, I think the Republican Party is suffering with the same thing, uh, although it's, I, think it's, I think it's the reverse. I think that a lot of people in the party know where they want to go, but there are like a faction of people saying this is a bad idea and like they're kind of being snuffed out as well. <laughs> so I right, think right, right. Ha- lacking a stable nucleus, lacking those core convictions and principles, lacking that philosophy, especially in your speech, I think can be a very negative thing, can cause you to have no moral consistency. In my opinion, if you have no moral consistency, you don't have a system or a party or a structure worth following. Now, I understand the argument you have to simplify. I get that. Mm -hmm. But when, but the problem with that is when you simplify, you have to eventually get to a point where you let people have a little bit more than just the simple talking points, because talking points can only sustain so much. Talking points right now are animating an entire infrastructure, an entire environment of the commentariat in America that keeps feeding people nonsense and lies and things to make them angry and then extract profit from that anger. I mean, talking points have been some of the most destructive forces in all of American society, going back to the colonial ages, where people had you know, pikes put in their mouths for gossiping, going back to the Red Scare, where McCarthy would run people in front of uh, his committee and say, hey, are you a communist? Well, you disagree with me, you're a communist, and lock them up. I mean, talking points, and of course, it's manifested in different ways. And right now, talking points, I don't think, have the kind of severity they had during the McCarthy era directly. I don't think we have people coming before committees or may, maybe it, maybe, it, maybe, maybe they do. It depends. Maybe they it do. depends <laughs> on who's being targeted. Yeah, yeah maybe they yeah. do. Maybe they do. But they the way that they can shape and mode our world and then mode how we operate in our world, that's concerning to me. So that's just, that's my concern because I, I, I think mm-hmm. that philosophy can be an antidote, like real genuine philosophy with death can be an antidote to a lot of talking points. That's not to say that all philosophy is good philosophy. That's just the exact opposite. There are some philosophies right now that are motivating us uh, in my personal opinion. I'm not sure if you agree with this, but I think that a lot of philosophies that involve critical race theory and things of that sort and who praise identity and de- de- degrade uh, individuality, those philosophies are very in vogue in certain parts in America. And I think those are very ultimately destructive. So not all philosophy is good philosophy, but I think that the kind of philosophy of libertarianism uh, is, is endemic to libertarianism is good philosophy and can be and it can be entrenched in its goodness if we... Um, keep the message consistent and if we uh, keep a layer of death to the message. What do you think about that? Let's be very clear, Christian. If we sacrifice our philosophy at the altar of electability, we will lose the entire purpose of our existence and we won't win because there's already two parties filled with people who will sacrifice everything for electability. Um, Republicans and Democrats are built around a long con of playing people against each other. Um, And so everything that comes from that is based on protecting and upholding and entrenching and furthering that long con. Uh, That's why they play the good cop, bad cop routine. That's why Democrats play good cop to their base and then play bad cop to the other base. That's why Republicans pay play good cop to their base and bad cop to the other base, because the idea is what you have to pick. You have to pick between these two. There is no real underlying philosophy behind that, except the philosophy of fleecing everyone around them. Now, I think what happens, Christian, is that often people conflate what we believe with our outreach. So for example, 
in the Libertarian Party and the Libertarian movement in general, we've been presented with a false binary option. Now, here we are again, Libertarians who hate false binary options. We're told you have to pick Democrat or Republican. And we go, no, I, that's not even close to being true, or you have to pick between these lesser evils. But yet we've been presented with lesser evils in the party. Those lesser evils are to either water down our message to the point of it really not being much of anything. Going to people and saying, you know, we don't like taxes, but really, you know, if we cut taxes by five or 10 percent and, you know, or maybe replace this type of tax with this type of tax, then, you know, that'll be a good thing. That's what libertarians really believe. Instead of saying, no, we're against taxation, we believe that we should be uh, uh, transitioning government into a voluntarily funded model and explain how much better it is. So we're presented with either the idea of watering things down or the other lesser evil, and you have to choose which evil is lesser, of being brutalists. So when someone comes up to you and says, I'm worried about the cost of my health care. You know, what is your plan for that? Instead of trying to explain to them how our system works and how, how libertarianism and libertarian ideals and, 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 and an actual system of free enterprise and, and dismantling the cronyism would make health care better. Instead saying to them, well, you don't have a right to health care. Uh, you know, you, you must think that you are, are do the, the, you know, the, the product of my labor. Sounds like you like slavery and all, you know, and, and, and you know, the, this brutalist way of presenting it, that you either have to walk in and be a total mealy mouthed, um, you know, watered down milk toast, or you have to come in and kick their furniture over and, and call them a statist and a bootlicker and walk out. Those are both terrible options, terrible ideas for their own special reasons. The way to present our principles, and again, this is something that as libertarians, we aren't consequentialists. We aren't libertarians because it works. We're libertarians because it's right. And so we often get caught in our own trap of not using consequentialist presentation or consequential presentation to you know normies to the masses to people who don't really care the average person doesn't really care about philosophy or principle they care about how are they going to be able to put food on their tables how are their kids going to be able to get a good education and be able to have a future how are they going to be able to afford the things they need housing health care higher education uh, food uh their rent everything else go ahead no, sorry. Excuse me. Uh, do, do you imagine that the average per do you imagine that the average person not caring about philosophy or principle might be one of the problems with the with, with the infrastructure right now with, with the, the the political with one of the problems of how people approach politics? Because I think it, it's it's yeah it's why it's why the average voter is so easily swayed one way or another, and the goal is to bring them into our philosophy. But if I walk up to someone who is so blinded, you know, so has the blinders on for their specific situation that they are going through right now. And every other candidate and politician is messaging to them on their concerns. And I'm talking to them about a philosophy. They're not even going to listen to me. At best, they'll ignore me. At worst, they'll think that I don't care about them and I'm neglecting them and they'll hate me. So when someone comes to me and says, what are you going to, I, I did an event in, uh, in Oakland and this happened more than a few times, but I always reference this one because it was actually recorded. It's on my, on my YouTube channel. And someone came up and started talking about lamenting about how bad the schools were in Oakland. And they said, what are you going to give us uh, to, you know, fix our schools? You know, if you, if you win the election, what are you going to give us to fix our schools? Now this audience was half libertarian, half Oakland locals who just showed up because there was a big bus saying, you know, something about running for president. The half that were libertarians automatically start grumbling. I can already hear them grumbling. What are we going to do? We're not going to give you anything. And here's how I answer that. I said, we're going to give you everything back. The reason your schools are bad is because you've been robbed of your power and your freedom and your money in your communities to be able to make decisions for your schools. The money's been taken out of your communities and put into central planning by a bunch of people who do not care what your schools look like. They don't care about your children's future. They don't care about you or your kids or your community or anything else. They just care about fleecing you. And our plan is to give you all of that back, to dismantle that centralized control of, of education and put it back in the hands of you as parents and teachers and your community members and be able to decide what your schools look like, decide how your schools operate, decide the policies for your schools to best fit your kids in your community and have all of your money back to be able to do that. Now, I just sold that person on decentralization of education. I sold them, I, I, taught, I specifically said, dismantling the Department of Education. I got an applause because of the way I presented it. 
I sold them on defederalizing education. And really, I didn't rule out getting the state out of education and just making it, you know, a community based, maybe even a privatized system. I kept it intentionally vague on that point, but I was definitely selling them on getting the feds out of it. And they applauded it because I sold it as what it is, giving the power back to the people. And when you present something that way, in, in a, dare I say, almost populist way, it connects with them both in terms of listening to what their concerns are and presenting a viable way of fixing that, and also playing to their, their in, in inherent moral uh, belief that the problem is powerful people are imposing themselves on everyone. So it plays into, and it's not pandering because we're not watering down our message. And ultimately it's true. We're taking the populist messaging back. Power to the people means giving the power back to the people, not centralizing it into the people that said power. And so we're kind of reclaiming that populism. We're reclaiming that, that the consequence, the consequentialism of how libertarianism actually fixes these problems. And ultimately, the longer I can keep folks in, you know, get people into libertarianism and get them, you know, in love with our ideas, the longer time we have to get them married to the entire idea of why that works. Why does decentralizing education work? Why does ending the crony system in healthcare work? Why do these things work? And the reason being, of course, because you own yourself, you have autonomy over yourself. And the best way to be able to fix things is to allow people to voluntarily interact with each other and, and respecting each other's lives and rights and properties in fixing the problems that they face. It brings them back into the core philosophy of libertarianism, but you have to meet them where they are. This is true of anything, selling someone a product, getting people involved in your ideas, getting people to join your organization, whatever, you know, th this comes right up how to win friends and influence people. You have to meet people where they are. You have to show that you care about them and empathize with them. And then you have to show them how you can fix the problems that they're facing and then show them how, and then as you do that, show them how your greater idea of, of how things should work is, is why that, that works that way. Yeah, Dale Carnegie was brilliant, and, and it's uh, yes, it's, it's a great tribute to him for you to take. Uh, that's a great tribute to him, in my opinion. Um, yeah, no, all that sounds all that sounds very good, and I think that it's partic the particularly compelling part of that answer is that you weren't necessarily. I, I, I would I would be very careful. I wouldn't say that you were being populist. I would say that you're simply stating. So you're simply stating a conclusion that corresponds with reality. And the reality is, and a lot of, especially, this is a, this is a universal set, um, condition around America, but especially in urban areas like Oakland, people, uh, the black community there are being, they're being run roughshod yep. over by a bunch of people who think that they can decide their education better than them. Mm -hmm. um, which is one of the reasons why places like Oakland and Chicago, whenever they have tried to do charter schooling or private schooling, it has met, met immense, immense resistance from two yep. forces the unions the superintendents and the teachers <laughs> but public school teachers mostly yeah, because yeah. they all have a stake in the system i mean bastiat made a very compelling point in the law he said when the government gets big enough to simplify it government gets big enough everyone everyone's private interest becomes public goods basically mm -hmm. people begin to want to <laughs> cultivate that so yeah in my opinion that's what's happening what do you think no that's exactly what's happening i was i, I was rereading bastiat over the weekend because um, it's easy. It's, <laughs> rereading the law is easy. It's not very long. And, and I realized that because someone said, you know, uh, they asked me about a part in it. And I said, yeah, I forgot that. And I, and I realized, you know, it's probably been close to 10 years since I had last, well, maybe not 10 years, probably six, seven years since I read it. So I was rereading it. And, and one of the quotes is, and I know I'm going to butcher it now because it's not in front of me, but basically the delusion of the day is the idea of enriching all classes at the expense of one another. And it just distilled the, the whole idea behind the farce of the benevolent state, which is that the idea that, well, we're going to group you into different groups, we're going to make you hate each other, and then we're going to convince you that we're going to rob everyone else to make you, in a, you know, put you in a better position. But we're saying that to everyone. I'm going around. It's like if I grouped everyone watching this into, you know, five, six groups and I go to each one of those five or six groups and say, I'm going to take from them and give to you because they don't know what they're talking about over there. And then, but, but I do it to every single group. And then I do exactly what I said I would do. I take from everyone and give a little bit back to each group. Now I happen to skim some off the top and I centralize control of everything so that I'm the one calling all the shots and everyone's doing worse. And then I can harness that resentment 
and get them to blame each other. Well, no, it's not me taking everything from you and, and running roughshod over you that led to your bad your, your your bad predicament that you're in. It's their fault. They right. didn't think you deserve that. We're going to take even more from that. And, and you keep playing this con game. And that's why it's important for the Republicans and Democrats to exist in that con game, because you have to give a theater of opposition. If it were just one group of people, eventually you'd say, wait a second, you're all in on it. But if you can pretend that, you know, there's this great battle of good and evil uh, and you have to decide which side's good and which side's evil. Uh, and the whole time you find yourself just rationalizing every choice being made by your side, because at least they're better than the other side. That's just all part of the con game. But yeah, no, what the, the system that has been set up and especially for the most marginalized among us, we talk about black communities, you talk about poor communities, you talk about, you know, uh, gender and sexual minorities or ethnic minorities or any of the groups that are, you know, because they are in both a situation of being a numeric minority and also typically having the least amount of, of uh, economic and social capital in this system, they're the ones that are typically the easiest victims. It, at this point, it doesn't even matter if the system is racist or not. The system's just a predator. It goes after whoever's the easiest person to go after. And if that person happens to be poor or black or you know, gay or trans or, or an immigrant or homeless or whatever they are, well, that's just a factor of them being easier to target. It, it easier to, to, to be able to go after without any real uh, 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 repercussions as a result of it. So no, I, this is a system of thieving and of, and of extortion, basically. And, and the only way to end the extortion is to clue people into the fact that they are being lied to, that they are part of a con game, and that the only way to get out of it is to kick the clowns out of office. I don't know if I coined this term or someone else did, but they stop conning you when you stop letting them. It only works if you go along with it. If we don't go along with it, if enough of us don't go along with it and kick them out and replace them with people who are on the up and up with everyone and who recognize that the system is the problem, then we're well on our way to fixing this. Interesting. Let, let, let's talk about the, the thing you said there about the marginalized communities. I think because I find this a very interesting dialogue amongst libertarian circles. So mm -hmm. I was I was reading, I was reading. Well, first let me just um put my my uh my understanding of this out there. I personally, Spike, and this may seem a little bit nitpicky. So excuse me if it does. But personally, sure. and I shouldn't have said this myself. Um, I don't like the idea of the black community or whatever because in my because. It seems to me to be like a sort of ling linguistic contradiction because it puts so much emphasis on this sort of artificial, large construct that is independent of the individual. When in all reality, communities are simply mm -hmm. the uh, intricate connection of individuals. That's all they are. Of individuals, yeah. 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 So I, I think that a lot of sociologists and a lot of people of a particular political persuasion, persuasion get it very wrong when they try to link the destinies of all black people or all gay people or all whatever uh, X category here together on the basis of one characteristic while completely utterly ignoring uh, everything else about them, ignoring their diamondism as a human being. So that's, I, I, I try not to say, but it's convenient though for us when we're talking about African-Americans at large to say the black community. So I'm, I'm trying to work on that myself, but um, what, do, I, I remember I was reading Hannah Arendt recently, and she's not a libertarian from what I can gather, but she said in her book, Totalitarian, Totalitarianism, part three, she said, um, one of the preconditions for total domination, one of the preconditions for totalitarianism is to reduce the diverse set of individuals, get rid of individualization, collapse them under a single identity single phrase and convince their free convince them that freedom is about preserving or acting towards whatever that single phrase implies it is my earnest opinion that there have been actors in the country i, I think particularly ones on the left although the, the, there are some right-wing actors that do this as well but particularly ones on the left that well they reduce a lot of the, those marginalized people into certain categories and convinces them that their their freedom, that their pursuit to a good life is going to involve them overcoming all these barriers. Um, and it's gonna involve legislation. It's going to involve endorsing certain concepts like you know Ibram X. Kennedy's anti-racism, which in my opinion is much more about endorsing particular ideological tenets as opposed to simply being in the negative in the absence of racism. Um, and right. so, I think that you're seeing a lot of what Hannah Arendt 
in a, obviously she wrote that back in the 50s, but you're seeing a lot of what she meant. I'm not saying that they're trying to get us to a totalitarian state. I'm saying that they are exhibiting traits of a desire to dominate something. And so I suppose my question is this, when Joe Jorgensen retweeted Black Lives Matter and we would have to be an anti-racist over the summer, a lot of mm -hmm. people were concerned. And a lot of people who were concerned were greeted by some people who said, if you're concerned by this, you're not libertarian, you're a crypto conservative fascist or whatever. And, you know, I am, I'm one of those sort of conservatively and libertarians and I was a little bit concerned. Not because I, I didn't think that she was, she was wrong to wade into the topic, just because I think that the language she used, it, even if she meant it in a sort of way that was not implying active, like positive and interventionist political action. Um, and I don't think she right. meant it in that way. Even if she meant it in a way that was not implying that, when you use, when you borrow the terms that are being used in public consciousness to mean a certain thing, people get confused. So I, I don't, I would never try to act in bad faith and accuse Joe of doing something that she wasn't trying to do. But people were concerned and, and that concern underlied a rift in the libertarian movement. And that rift is between, I think people who um, are a little bit more conservative and simply want the government to stay out of everything. And people who think that, hey, yeah, we can, the government can stay out of things, but there should still be some efforts made by us to address what these ills are, sort of bleeding heart libertarians. And, you know, we have to, we have to keep the, we have, we have, we have to keep the government as contained as possible while also being willing to kind of use it to address some of these problems. So, but I also find, and excuse me, I'm speaking a lot, excuse me. I also find that the way you approach certain issues can really influence how you see them. So for example, police brutality, um, regardless of what paradigm you hold, if you are a libertarian, you get into office and you're in a position of power, you will most likely address police brutality. If you see police brutality as an issue of racism or as an issue of just people being um, going sick with power, you will address police brutality. Now, you'll address it either way. Exactly. Right. Now, the efficacy of how you address police brutality, if you have a certain paradigm, that's the question. That's the question. So if you see those people going sick with power, maybe you would say, okay, well, let's, uh, let's make sure that you know, there are, uh, there's a national body cam mandate for all police departments. Let's make sure that qualified immunity is stripped down to its to its lowest bidder so that if someone is aggrieved, they can go ahead and sue. Let's make sure that civil asset forfeiture is ended. Let's make sure that we are doing, we're not rejecting police officers that have an IQ above a hundred something. There was a police department that said, we will not have someone with an IQ. Let's make sure that's not happening. Let's have a national mandate. So I don't mind using the government to protect individual rights, no problem at all. But if you're adjusting it from the lens of race, you may, Put things in that there that in there that are superfluous and 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 that's just my concern. So I'm not saying that the issues about race in America are superfluous and that black folks haven't had a trying time in the country. I'm just saying that there is a certain contingent of people in, in libertarianism and in general society that really want me to be bound to my historic this is the historical circumstances of my race and who want me to act in that framework and I don't want to. What do you think about that? Right. So. So that's the delineation there. There is acknowledging, because ultimately, I, let's, let's step back, Christian. Obviously, as libertarians, our goal is to create and foster a society in which everyone is treated as an individual. Respect for their individual person, their lives, their rights, their property, the judgment of individuals based on their individual merit, and the ability of individuals to form voluntary associations with one another, organizations, groups, companies, nonprofits, co-ops, mutual aid, whatever, to be able to come up with voluntary and, and, um, and vibrant and, and, and sometimes cooperative and sometimes competitive solutions to the problems that we face. We recognize that fostering individual liberty leads to all of us having a better society. And it's based on a much more just way of uh, organization of how people are allowed to interact with one another, as opposed to a system of top-down controlled theft and plunder and, and, and grouping of people into, you know, competing groups to fight each other and tribalism and divide and conquer and all of that. We are the antidote to that. In looking at the society that we presently live in, it is easy to, to see based on a very brief glimpse of the data, much less a, 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 a more uh, deep dive into it, 
that if someone is poor, and honestly, poverty is probably the biggest single uh, indicator at this point in our, in, in our society. If someone is poor, or if someone is black or brown or, or basically not white, or if someone is a religious minority, or if someone is a gender and sexual minority, statistically, and again, this is obviously from an individual basis, each person's experience is different. But statistically, we can see that based on those different um, those different category, categorizations, those intrinsic qualities that they have no real control over, that their situation, that the way that they are treated by the justice system, that the way that they are treated by the, you know, the financial system, we can see that it's not as good as if someone is above a certain income level, or if they are white, or if they fall into the more, uh, you know, standard or traditional uh, ethnic and, and, and sexual and gender presentations. This doesn't mean that we should be grouping people together and then coming up with group-based solutions. It means the opposite. Group-based solutions is what got us here. So when I can't speak for Joe, I can't speak for what she meant with that tweet. And unfortunately, we never really got a good definition of what was meant by actively anti-racist. And, and I'm not sure we ever will. So I, I can't speak on something I didn't do and, and don't know the answer to. Uh, I believe that what she was saying, and this is me just spitballing here, I believe what she was saying is that libertarianism is anti-racist in how, it, it, again, going into consequentialism, is anti-racism in that when you take power from a racist, now they're just a schmuck with a bad opinion. A racist who hates you because you're black, but has absolutely no ability to do anything negative to you in any way other than to refuse to associate with you really does not affect your life. But a racist in a position of power who is able to implement laws and enforce laws and you know, you know, implement a, a, a policy in a way that affects you negatively, and they can actually weaponize that hatred using the mechanism of the state, is now a problem for you. The problem is the system. Again, the problem is the system. Again, I, and, I, and I'm not going to try to claim that that's what she meant. That's what I think she meant. That's how I, during the campaign, how I best tried to spin it, I don't know what she meant by it. And, and, and that was the problem with that messaging and, and, the, and the racial messaging in general is that it, it spoke to the concerns of people about racial issues, but didn't really drive it home to how we could fix it. It just said, yes, we recognize there's a problem here. Okay, now what? You mentioned police brutality. We know that police brutality disproportionately affects people of color, disproportionately affects the poor. You know, a lot of times when I talk about marginalized communities, I'll start talking about Appalachia. These are people that are as white as it gets, but they're also experiencing some of the worst outcomes of any person in this country. These are white people who have been here for hundreds of years or whose ancestors have been here for hundreds, come from descend from people who have been here for hundreds of years and are having a really, really rough go at it because of the situation that they're in, largely because of their, their just being extremely poor and therefore not of any real value to people that are in power. So they're treated as, as you know, throwaway. The answer isn't to try to play to their white identity politics any more than the answer to, you know, dealing with the issues of people of color is to deal to their black identity politics. The answer is to meet them where they are. So if there are people out in the streets protesting police brutality, we meet them where they are. I went to Black Lives Matter protests. I actually spoke at a, a protest that was uh, hosted by Black Guns Matter, uh, which is Maj Teray's group. Uh, and it was co-sponsored by a local Boogaloo Boys group and a local militia <clears throat> a local Black Lives Matter group, and also a local um, uh, Black Panther and Huey P. Newton Gun Club group. And when I went there, I talked about our policies to end police brutality, our policies to end the war on guns, because you can't say that Black Lives Matter if Black lives or any other lives aren't allowed to defend themselves. Um, and I spoke to their concerns. So if someone shows up to me and says, my concern is that uh, you know racists are allowing the police to disproportionately harm us because we're people of color and because we're poor, I say, yes, that's a problem. Here's how we fix it, by ending qualified immunity, by ending the war on drugs, by ending occupational licensing laws, by ending zoning laws, by ending the war on guns, by ending the things, the weapons that these bad people are using to impose themselves upon you. So 
And then the, the longer I can have that rapport and discussion with them, be able to have a longer conversation about the real problem here. The core of this issue is that we have a system that is based on grouping people as opposed to respecting them as individuals. But you can't really start there. If someone comes up to me and says, you know, I want to fix these problems. What is your fix? And I say, well, the problem is we aren't being treated, you know, we aren't respecting each other as individuals instead of addressing how to fix that specific problem, then I've lost them because they want to talk to someone who is going to fix that specific problem. So that's my my belief on that. But it always has to go back to the, the again, as we were talking about before, bringing them to the core belief in libertarianism. And the core belief of libertarianism as it relates to race is that we need to do everything we can to dismantle anything that stands in the way of allowing individuals to be treated as individuals, to be respected as individuals, to be judged as individuals, and to be able to interact with one another as free individuals. I, I think, and I, I hear what you're saying, and I, I agree with like 99% of it. I just think that the when you, when you accept the premise um, of a lot of racially uh, based protest organizations or organizations that see wide injustices. When you accept the premise, I think you get into danger there, at least for the maintenance of libertarian principles. Let me give you an example. If you were to accept, if let's say there's a Black Lives Matter activist that believes that the United States is a country um, birthed entire, birthed from colonial slave labor, and therefore it is inherently an evil country, because there are some, there are many, many that believe that. It's not a fringe belief, in that and that people of a certain race, particularly white people, have no moral license to speak on the issues that plague and that ail African Americans and in, in their and their understanding, and that um, part of the reparations process is going to be a financial reparations is going to be B having white people repent for this into their ancestors is going to be C it's going to be C analyzing all of these sort of inequities and including inequities within inequalities um, through the lens of a sort of mechanism like critical race theory which doesn't really use reason it simply uses um, it, it analyzes things in a very very odd and, and very narrow minded way it's actually one of the most perverse right. social sciences and that it uses a single variable to explain a lot of differently complex things, including the police brutality thing, including the disparity thing. So I, I, it's not, it's not, there's nothing wrong with saying, hey, yeah, there's a disparity between uh, how blacks are treated with the police or whatever. Um, but the problem is, and I think Thomas Saul mentions this, how, how do we explain these disparities? Where do they come from? So I think that's the primary thing we have to focus on. But if you accept the premise, hey, yeah, there's a problem here. And if you silently accept that it may be a racially based problem rather than just a problem that is endemic to a particular, a particular demographic or the geography or the thing that is occurring in that particular area, you can they can then rope you in to other kind of stuff, which is why I think that Joe's anti-racist message was a little bit precarious because yeah, it's great to be against racism. And if you just said, I am against racism, that carries a different connotation than saying, I am anti-racist. When you say, I'm anti-racist, you also mean, okay, according to that belief, I'm going to support a certain candidate. Okay, according to that belief, I'm going to support certain ideas. Okay, according to that belief, I'm going to be politically active in this particular ideology, because anti-racism is not just being against racism, it's being for something else. So uh, that's my concern. And maybe it's a very meticulous concern of mine, but I... So Sorry, well, I, I, so I, I guess I guess my question is the, the differentiation there. I consider myself anti-racism because I'm against racism. If someone else has created a, 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 a definition for anti-racist that includes a lot of stuff that has nothing to do with actual racism and is instead really just a way of branding their 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 specific power play that they want to do or their specific, uh, you know, hackneyed philosophy as to how to fix this then that's a them problem. So for example, I call myself a free market capitalist. Now, there are people who use the term capitalism to refer to the status quo, crony, corporate, quasi-fascist system that we're under right now. And I absolutely reject that, but I also reject their definition. So I, I don't feel comfortable with the idea that I can't say, and maybe I'm, I'm misunderstanding what you're saying. I don't feel comfortable with the idea that I can't say I'm against racism or that I'm anti-racism. 
uh, any more for that matter than I uh, uh, am comfortable with the idea that I can't say I'm anti-fascism without being uh, tied to people that are throwing bricks at people or, you know, that are, are smashing windows at, at, you know, small, small businesses and, 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 and people's homes and things like that. I, I, I'm not comfortable with that idea that, that I am not that, you know, once someone has claimed a term or a set of terms that I can no longer operate in that space. And, and also that if anyone is in that space that is complaining about something that we have, that we have in, in similar orbits of agreement with that I should be, and maybe again, maybe I'm misunderstanding you that I shouldn't be meeting them where they are and explaining how our 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 solutions would actually actually fix that problem. A very similar thing. I I went to a lot of uh, talked to a lot of anti lockdown people uh, over the last year because we were the only ones who were you know 100 against the lockdowns and the mandates. I spoke to a lot of people, a lot of uh, gun rights groups, and a lot of others who would use terms like patriotism who would use terms like, um, well, they were a lot of them were conservative. They would use terms like the American dream. They would use a lot of different terms that I also uh, agree with to some extent, but their version of patriotism was different than mine. Their version of patriotism is okay with people who want to come and participate in the American dream being put in cages because their paperwork isn't in order. Uh, or their version of patriotism might include uh, bombing countries around the world. It, it, I'm not accusing all of them, but many of them are fine with the, the wars happening overseas. They think that that's protecting us and don't recognize that that's a bad thing. But I wouldn't go there and say, well, I don't also consider myself a patriot or, or, you know, or, or someone who wants people to participate in the American dream because they've labeled it something in, that in my mind is a very perverted version of that. Um, I think that it's actually more crucial to take back terms and to meet people where they are so we can bring them over to our ideas. So I, and I wanna make sure I'm not misrepresenting what, what you're saying. Do, do you think it was, I, I guess, let me ask you this, um, because I, 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 like I said, I, I was not a fan of the tweet I was her, uh, you know, I was her running mate, so I couldn't throw her under, under the bus. I did my best to try to spin it into a libertarian way. I think it was a tweet that was done as part of a larger speech, if I recall, and didn't, you know, this, th that's the beauty of Twitter is it's 140 characters. It didn't unpack what she actually meant, and we may never know what she actually meant. You, you, you'd honestly have to ask her. But so I wasn't a fan of that. Was there anything that I did during the campaign that you felt as though you know, what was doing what you're saying, you know, uh, uh, surrendering to, you know, critical race theory or to their ideas or anything like that. And if so, I, I, I'm not putting you on the spot. If there's something that I that, you know, you think I did wrong, I'd certainly love to hear it. I, no, I'm not no. above reproach or criticism. No, 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 of course not. No, 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 no. Here, here's what I'm saying, Spike. Okay, let me let me clarify. I, okay. think, I think that. Okay, was, okay. Let me, let me clarify. I don't think that you should inherently eschew terms all the time if people have different understandings of those terms than you do. I think naturally people are going to have subjective understandings of certain terms, especially when they are very broad. The idea of patriotism is a very broad term. It's been around for a very, very, very long time. Right. Um, my Anti-racism, however, should be contextualized and understood in this context. That's a very specific term. And that's a term that has kind of evolved and has kind of really only gotten solid definition, I would argue, in the past few years with the advent of certain um, academic papers and the uh, presentation of certain academic ideas that come from people like Kimberly Crenshaw and most recently, Ira Max Kendi, who just wrote a New York Times bestseller about how to be an anti-racist, which is being right. taught in universities, even in my universities across the nation. This is a very recent bestseller and he has made presentations on it. So I'm not saying that because Kendi has a version of the word, you shouldn't use the word. I'm saying that if you say that word when the public consciousness, that word means a very particular thing and its meaning is not really broad, that can confuse people and give people the wrong impression. So just for consistency sake, I would just specify if you were to use that word, yeah, I'm anti-racist, but I'm not anti-racist in the sense that I think that if you are, if you vote for a particular candidate or whatever, you are participating in racism. I'm anti-racist in the sense that I don't believe that racism itself is a good thing and I am actively against racism. That's, that's fine. Now, so I'm not saying that you can't use that term, I'm just saying that for concision's sake, given the connotations that term has in the modern public consciousness, probably would be just a good idea to say, hey, this is what I believe. Because if you say to a Black Lives Matter person 
or someone who is really deep into this social justice stuff and you say, hey, I'm anti-racist, they're going to think you mean what Kendi says and they're going to like hold you up to that standard. But if you say, hey, I'm anti-racist and here's what I mean by that. And here's what I, yeah, exactly. here's, here's how we, here's how we fight racism then. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and so, that's fair. So. I, and I, I believe that's what I've been doing, but I, I certainly, you know, one of the biggest criticisms I got during the campaign uh, was that I was, was pandering to the left. And I think some of that was unfair. I think that any attempt to reach people that weren't on the right was going to be labeled pandering to the left by, by some on the right. Um, but I, I do think that there was a concern, it, at least some of, it, some of it was born out of a concern that by going and speaking at Black Lives Matter events and talking to, you know, organizers of, you know, more left leaning things, that it would look as though I was, uh, you know, signing on to their beliefs. But the reality is when I was going there and really when I was going into right wing spaces, which, you know, anti lockdown stuffs were overwhelmingly right wing. I mean, there were certainly some people that weren't on the right there, but that was largely operated by people on the on the right. Um, and same thing with the, you know, the gun rights stuff, that's a little bit more uh, balanced, but certainly more right leaning, I would go in there to present libertarian ideas to people in that in that self-selected community. Um, and, and obviously in going into those things to meet them where they are, to, to focus on what we agree on, but then also to, to the, the, the goal is to pull them out of the other authoritarian bugaboos that they have and, and get them you know, actualized as libertarians. Um, so no, I mean, that's always the challenge is making sure that you're meeting people where they are, but not giving a, a, a sense that you are also believing in a bunch of things that you don't believe in. Yes, we agree on ending police brutality. And here, here are our proposed set of ways that we've been talking about for decades how to do that. No, I don't think that the problem is that white people are all inherently racist. No, I don't think that all black people are above reproach. No, I don't think that there isn't some individual uh, uh, responsibility that has to be taken for our lives. But yes, I do believe that there are certain barriers and things that are in the ways of many people, including just people that are below a certain income level that we can get rid of by simply dismantling those barriers that exist. And, and the barrier isn't inequality. The barrier is the system that, that, that creates a, a barrier to entry uh, that if you don't have more than a certain income level, you're not going to be able to legally cross it. So you either have to engage in illegal economics and, and risk jail time time uh, or just not do it and you and be a you know a, a, a you know a, a, a working for someone else and making them money um right. so you know I, I think that's the way to address it is to is to meet them where they are but yes you can't you have to make sure that you're not um you're not giving the appearance of buying into their ba bad ideas that may be associated with with them or with the terms that they're using all right. Yeah. No, and I, and my apologies if I was unclear of what I was saying. I, I did not mean to be. Oh, I, 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 I think it was a misunderstanding on my part. Because really, Spike, you do phenomenal work for Liberty. And so I'm going to let you, I'm about to let you go. I know we've been down here for I think about an hour now, I think. Uh, like but that. I have one, I'll have one question for you. Though. Mm -hmm. um, when the lockdowns first began, well, actually, this is actually way after they first began. In the, in the summer, around August, I had a, f a friend of mine asked me, who has libertarian sympathies, they asked, they said, Christian, you know, um, you know, I know, what do you think about all the lockdown protests that have been happening? Because I'm quite embarrassed about some people on the libertarian right who have just been going out there and protesting this stuff. Like, it is just so embarrassing. And I'm like, well, look, I think that people have people have a certain affinity towards their natural freedom and they want to be able to exercise that. And I think that, you know, we shouldn't be embarrassed. I think that maybe, we, maybe methods could change. Maybe, you know, tack could be, could be in Cause like right at that point, tack was not being, tack no, was, there was you, no you tack. People tack was were saying hard. stuff like, I don't, <laughs> was yeah. Hard. People were saying stuff like, <laughs> I don't, you know, my rights are more important than your life. And it's like, yeah. that's like the worst way to say, like, yeah. no, don't do that. Yeah. God. There was, there, there yeah. was no, there was no tack. Cause if you really believe in rights, everyone's life is important. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. exactly. So, uh, there was no tack. Um, but um, they also said, I said, so like, you know, I said, he said, well, look, I just wear my mask. And I'm like, that's fine. He's like, well, you believe in mask mandates? I'm like, no, I don't believe in mask mandates. And she's like, well, in every place they've been tried, they've worked. Like in South Carolina, they put mask mandates in and the, the rates go down, went down. I thought to myself, well, that may be true, but what is associated with a mask mandate? 
what is associated with the mass movement is, is sometimes it's voluntary action towards particular things. Sometimes it's more social distancing, but sometimes it's more isolation. So maybe the mandate wasn't what got the rates down. Maybe it was people who actually would just be isolating more or distancing more, just not going out generally. Because around that time, I mean, businesses were shut down. I mean, there was nothing to do outside. Yeah. So I think that authoritarianism or tendencies to be authoritarian on the basis of consequentialist ideology get very, very, very bolstered mm -hmm. when statistics can demonstrate that certain things, quote unquote, work. So what do you think about how do you deal with that argument? Okay, this works right here. This saved lives. Therefore, it is good rather than even if it's an unjust thing that is work, quote unquote, working. And, and this is where the consequentialism comes in, right? So we now have the benefit of over a year of data that shows us that they it largely didn't work. So in South Carolina, where we had almost no mandates, no lockdowns, no anything, our total rate of infection and total rate of death per capita is roughly the same as that of California, who has had some of the most strict lockdowns and mandates across their state. Uh, we saw that in uh, North Dakota and South Dakota, uh, which North Dakota had much more restrictive regulations than South Dakota has had, their rates are roughly the same. We've seen that Florida, who started by having uh, you know, some fairly strict lockdowns early on, but has since abandoned them and had pretty much nothing or, or very little in, in the way of regulations, has had actually a slightly better uh, uh, outcome than California. The World Health Organization said months ago that long-term lockdowns don't work. The point of an of a, of a sh even short-term lockdown, like a two-week lockdown, is to give hospitals times time to you know, retool and get ready for the, the incoming surges of, uh, of, of, of waves of, of the infected. Instead, what happened was the lockdowns actually imposed restrictions on the hospitals that caused a bunch of them to have to shut down because they couldn't afford to stay running. So it actually made us less able to deal with the incoming surges. All of this to say that, uh, I want to go back, I, the easiest way to answer your question is, uh, is to talk about what I did when when the pandemic first happened, when when or when when I first knew that the pandemic was here in force, uh, after it, it, interestingly enough, in fe it, it, the beginning of last February, uh, after being in the New Hampshire primaries or being up there for the New Hampshire primaries, uh, around tens of thousands of hundreds of thousands of people, I got very very sick, and I thought, huh, I wonder if I have this coronavirus thing, and I went to the doctor uh, up there in Massachusetts. I went up to the doctor. And because uh, I was too sick to even get home. And uh, and I went to the doctor and said, you know, do you think I have this coronavirus thing that that they're talking about? And they said, we have no way of knowing we can't test you. And I found out afterwards that was because the CDC wasn't allowing testing, which is what allowed it to spread out of control. If we want to talk about what works and doesn't work, not letting healthcare professionals do their job uh, does not work. But all that to say, so eventually I got home a few days later when I started feeling a little bit better. And as it was becoming apparent that COVID was here, there was community spread, and we didn't know a lot about it. I actually chose not to go. I, I was uh, supposed to go to the, um, well, I was actually still sick for the Florida convention, so I ended up not going to that. But I was supposed to go to the Kentucky convention and the Virginia convention, uh, and I canceled those. Because I said, right now, we don't know much about this virus, and I don't want to be inadvertently spreading something uh, that, you know, I may not even know that because they were talking about uh, asymptomatic uh, infection and stuff like that. And I'm like, I don't want to inadvertently be a vector in, you know, in this pandemic. Very early on, we don't know what's going on. So I stayed home for the most part. I mean, I still went out and did the things I needed to do, but I didn't go and travel and, you know, and, and meet with thousands of people and all of that stuff. I also created some of the first libertarian anti-lockdown videos. So the first time I referenced being against lockdowns and, and making videos about why lockdowns don't work was in March of last year. Now I was choosing personally not to go and do all the stuff I would have otherwise done, but I recognize that when you lock everything down, that you're not actually fixing the problem. You're telling people, everyone stay home, if you have a business, it has to go out of business. If you, unless you're a major company, then you'll get a bailout or, or, we'll, or we'll mandate that only people can go and see you. So, you know, if you own a small, a small store, you get shut down. But if you own a Walmart, everyone has to go to you. 
Um, and if, you know, and, and of course now everyone has to go to Walmart at the same time and, you know, stay, you know, lot, hundreds of you at a time in the building together, you know, to help slow the spread of the virus and, and just the absurdity and the anti-intuitive thinking behind the lockdowns. The way to message against a lockdown isn't to say my rights matter more than your life or I don't care about this virus or I don't think this virus is real. The way to message against lockdowns and mandates and other, you know, wrongheaded ideas is the way that, that I was doing it all last year. I said, COVID-19 is real. It is, is serious. It needs to be treated seriously. Telling everyone to stay home until further notice is not a serious proposition. It is the response of a scared child. Everyone just stay in your house. It doesn't work. You destroy society as a result. And it's not feasible to make everyone stay home. People haven't been staying home. You can't stay home. If everyone stayed home for even two weeks, everything would fall apart. The, the, the farms would grow fallow. The, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the power plants would, would go down. We'd have no power. We'd have no internet. We'd have no anything. Uh, the, you know, you'd lose refrigeration. All the, yeah, I mean, like, society would crumble. It would take years to, to recover from two weeks of everyone staying at home. Well, if, ever, if everyone can't stay at home, and if people are still having even limited interaction, then a highly virulent pathogen, path, pathogen can still spread. So you're not stopping or slowing the spread of the virus. You're just destroying business. You're just destroying small businesses. You're just making people become unemployed. You're just making uh, children be subjected to their domestic abusers without any viable way to get out and try to tell about it. Uh, you are uh, leading to child suicide rates because they're not getting any socialization. Uh, we're discovering now just how crucial socialization is to young children. They're killing themselves. Uh, it leads to higher rates of addiction and abuse and depression and suicide and overdose and like all of these terrible things. And you didn't even slow the spread of the virus. Right. Everything goes back to authoritarianism doesn't work because it's not how we're supposed to interact with each other. It is both a moral argument and a consequentialist argument and a, a utilitarian argument. It is wrong and it doesn't work. If I can rob anyone whenever I see fit and order them around whenever I want to, I don't have to provide value. I don't have to be a good steward. I don't have to make sense. I don't even have to know what the hell I'm talking about because you don't have a choice out of my, my thing that I'm imposing on you. You don't have a way to opt out of my theft. You don't have a way to opt out of my orders and my extortion. You just have to go along with it. I don't have to have it make sense to you. I just have to force you to do it. That's why it doesn't work. And every single thing that we talk about, the, the, the core of libertarianism is built around the idea that we do best when we are most free. And these lockdowns showed it. The pandemic showed it. It wouldn't, the pandemic would have never been as bad as it was if the CDC had just let doctors test patients and be able to trace them and figure out where they are and get them contained and taken care of so that it didn't spread wildly out of control. We'd probably still have it. It wasn't like we were going to stop it from coming here, but it wouldn't have spread so wildly if state governments hadn't been shoving COVID patients into nursing homes. We wouldn't have had the high fatality rates that we had early on that led to everyone freaking out and saying, oh, everyone stay home. Government did this to us. Authoritarianism did this to us. The idea that a small handful of powerful people should be able to tell everyone else how to live did this to us. And the only way to fix these things and stop them from happening in the future, or at least ameliorate the consequences of them, is to dismantle that system and put the power back in the hands of the people. That's why I'm a libertarian. That's why I'm going around the country. That's why we're spreading these ideas. That's why we're trying to win, is because until we do that, things are going to continue being bad. Things will be good when we put the power back in the hands of the people. That is a brilliant way to end the show. That's so, uh, wow. I, I, I'm, I'm going to have to clip that out as a separate video. That's brilliant. That, that was just <laughs> brilliant. Wow. God. Well, Spike, um, thank you for coming on. I, no, I'm serious, man. I was, that was, I was, I was, you just, wow. I don't even know what to say after that. I can't follow that. <laughs> I don't even know what to say after that. Uh, no, no. Just going to end the show. Just so, okay, everyone, bye. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for coming on. I appreciate it. I hope you come back. I, I would love I to. I would love to come back. back. I always love talking to you, man. All right, awesome. Well, it's good seeing you and everyone. Please stay pent.